Hey all, I'm going to do a very quick introduction here on the uh, politics of American political parties. Uh, I posted uh, the lecture notes, the narrated slides. Uh, that should get most of what you need to know if you add into that as well the readings in our text, which would be, I think in this case, pages, uh, is it 341 to 361? Double check that. I have it right in front of me here. That looks right. Yes, indeed. Political parties. Basically, the first half of chapter 11. All right. Things that I want to say to you, though, to supplement that. Uh, we do live right now in an age of uh, what some have called hyper party polarization. That's, that's a mouthful. What that essentially means is our two political parties are, are further apart than they've been in the past. It, it, it's cyclical. These things change over time. It's the nature of the beast. Uh, but yeah, right now, relative to say when I came of political age in about uh, 1980, uh, 1980 was a time when maybe that process was just beginning. But circa 1980, uh, we had a Republican president, Ronald Reagan. Well, 81, January of 81, he came into office. He worked pretty closely with Democrats in the House of Representatives. I remember his very close relationship with. Uh, Representative Tip O'Neill of Massachusetts, liberal lion, uh, and those two got along like a house of fire. A couple of old Irishmen who like to drink whiskey every once and again. Uh, so that era of cooperation between the two parties has mostly vanished. Uh, the common ground has shrunk into probably almost nothing. And the two parties now, right, in many ways are at each other's throats. So we do live in an era of hyper-party polarization take note of that. It's not necessarily a permanent feature of our party politics, but it is certainly characteristic of our politics right now. Uh, what else? Um, each party, main party, electorally viable party, the Democrats, the Republicans, uh, each one has their own issues because they both have to be relatively big tent to attract a winning electoral coalition win national elections and even in most cases state elections. So they each try to encompass a broad range of voters that sometimes don't get along very well with one another. Uh, so what is it right now for the Democrats? We see that there's a surge on the left right now. You saw that Democratic Socialist candidate win in uh, New York City uh, to uh, I think I think she's um, if she's going to be running for the House of Representatives in November, and given that that's a heavily Democratic district, she'll, she'll, she'll win. And then you'll have a Democratic Socialist in the House of Reps within the Democratic Party. All right, pressure on the left. I think especially since uh, the election of Trump, you've seen an upsurge in uh, uh, the kind of the left progressive wing of the Democratic Party, making things hot and difficult for the establishment Democratic Party. Uh, so that's what the Democrats right now have to contend with. The more establishmentarian candidates, like let's say a Hillary Clinton or a Nancy Pelosi. Uh, and on the other hand, the, uh, the surging left progressive wing, Bernie Sanders, uh, this young woman in, in New York City, um, you know, calling for things like the abolition of ICE, uh, tending towards a more left sort of a vision for the country. So the Democrats, rather they're trying to bring those two together and, and win elections, it's very difficult and challenging. Uh, the Republicans have their own issues, right? Since the election of Trump, Trump in many ways, because he's the president, is, is in the process of redefining the Republican Party to be essentially the party of Donald Trump. Um, what that means ideologically is not at all clear, because I think Trump is somewhat ideologically blank. Uh, but and I think the touchstone for Trump is Trump wants to promote Trump and his brand and winning, um, and in order to do so, he has seen an opportunity here to situate himself as a Republican, and indeed as a conservative Republican. Is he at, at his core a uh, deeply committed, ideologically uh, consistent conservative Republican? <laughs> oh, oh, heck no! But he sees it as that you know play to that base and that's to his advantage. So, yeah, so the Republicans, right, on the one hand, yay, we're getting a lot done policy-wise that we want as a party, uh, but the, 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 the vessel here is, is deeply flawed, right? Evangelical Christians love this guy, and yet everything about him screams the opposite of evangelical Christianity. 
So that's been, you know, challenging. Challenging for the Republican Party to come to grips with this guy. And, and of course, uh, you know, what, what will it mean for the party once Trump leaves the White House by whatever method he ends up leaving the White House? Um, what, where will they be left when they lo no longer have Donald Trump? Uh, what will remain? Not at all clear. Since at some level, I think the party has sold its soul a little bit to Trumpism as a way to uh, exercise power at one brief moment in time. Is that a viable long-term political party strategy? That's not clear. Is, is Trump a one-off kind of a Republican figure, or is this the future of the Republican Party, that they will continue to generate this sort of leadership? Uh, in my own view, God forbid, but it is certainly possible. Uh, and of course, the Republican establishment, right, for a very long time was anybody but Trump when those many candidates were running to represent the party in uh, the presidential election of 2016. And uh, most of them have made their peace with reality. Uh, people like, uh, gosh, an awful lot of Republicans uh, had exactly that view. People like Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, Mitch McConnell. Senate Majority Leader, uh, Dean Heller of Nevada, um, and many, 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 many others. But at some level, right, once this guy wins through, you got to say, this is it, we're going to ride this horse, because that's the horse we have. If we don't, if we don't ride this horse, we don't have a horse to ride. Uh, so you suck it up, and you accept a certain amount of humiliation and redirection for the party in order to take advantage of the power while you have it as a party and you can achieve party goals through Trump but it comes with baggage that mo most I think of the Republican establishment would have preferred not to have had uh, but you take what you can get here in this in this in this life right so yeah fascinating it raises fascinating questions um, yeah for what 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 is the future of the Republican party yeah, and that continues to be a struggle, right, between the establishment still has a certain amount of discomfort with Trump, but Trump represents a certain reality that they have to come to grips with at some level. And you'll note that a lot of the establishment Republicans speaking out most strongly against Trump are, are members of Congress who are in the process of leaving Congress, uh, partly because of Trump. Um, yeah, and then you have John McCain, uh, who, yeah, he's... Uh, tragically dying of, uh, I think it's brain cancer in Arizona. Uh, he's been a strong and fierce critic of the president. So that's been super fascinating. I've long found the Republican Party to be a more interesting party than the Democratic Party, really from 1980 forward, in my humble opinion. It's frequently, for me at least, been hard to define what the Democratic Party represents exactly. Uh, they've been, I think, a little Charlie Brown, a little wishy-washy. The Republican Party has been more willing to uh, put it out there a bit and take a strong position, you know, even though I myself might find some of those positions disagreeable. Politically, I admire their, their willingness to put it out there and make a clear statement of what they represent and, and go with that and fight for that vision. Um, but then Trump adds a curveball to all of that since he's so ideologically blank. Uh, all right, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and I'll let you guys go.